السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ سوری فار لٹل بٹ ٹیکنیکل ایشوز وی ول بی لائف سون ان شاء اللہ السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ پیپل لائف کین یو ہیئر می پلیز گیو اے اسمال میسج آئی کین انڈرسٹینڈ وت آل دا پکچر اینڈ دا وائس از کلیئر Inshallah, after three minutes, we will start the seminar. For those who have joined, thank you very much for coming to listen to this seminar. I would like to share some of my knowledge which I have gained through all of my life. This is just a knowledge sharing. I'm not a teacher. There are more valuable, respectable teachers are coming next week and after coming weeks. Uh, I am just a simple, humble student of halal industry since 2010, and before that, originally I am from Pakistan, living in Japan since 1996. I have my master's degree from <coughs> University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, in food science and technology, and later on I came to Japan for my PhD in food science and technology from University of Tokyo. After working with uh, different type of food industries, I started work with a organic certification, which is similar to halal, only some standards are different. Method and technology is same. And in 2010, I have started the halal certification in Japan. So in Japan, Before 2010 and after 2010, the history of halal has come entirely different. We are blessed now that we have many food which is halal, many restaurants which is halal. The government respect our values. Uh, people of Japan also, they respect our values and they care about our halal uh, things. 
even when we eat dinner with some non-Muslim Japanese, they care that we should not eat anything which is not haram. So we are very much blessed in this case. And today I'm very happy that <clears throat> many of my food scientists, juniors from different universities of Pakistan are joining. I'm also happy that many of the food specialist, food industrialist are also joining. So it will be nice sharing some knowledge about Haram with all of you. And it is 10 minutes late. Uh, now I'm going to start the real topic of Halal. So today our topic is basics of Halal certification globally and locally in Pakistan. I changed the order because what was announced was locally in Pakistan and globally. But I make globally first because from globally I'll bring to Pakistan and from Pakistan I'll again compare that with other uh, countries, how it is going on. <clears throat> so first today's our agenda is the basics of halal of course i know that many of the participants who are joining are muslims but uh, i would be very happy to share a little bit different image of halal what we have learned during the school times so uh, i will discuss a little bit of sharia law and how al quran explain about halal what is the relationship of taqwa and halal and the purpose of halal certification, what is halal mark, how to read it, how to use it, how to uh, get the benefit from halal mark, and what is the science behind the halal certification. And then our agenda will continue for world's famous halal certification and accreditation bodies, uh, general procedures of halal certification, how much fee it is necessary to get halal certificate and documents required to get halal certificate. Halal certification is as a business, how people are looking around the world, this as a business opportunity and major halal producing and buyer countries. Those are some countries are famous for producers, some are famous for buyers. And then I'll go to the topic of halal in Pakistan and then halal in the world. I am watching my own iPhone screen, but my slides are not changing. Can Muhammad Yunus guide me that? Slides are being changed to the second and third slide or not? So let's go to the halal. Basically, halal is a international terminology introduced in through Arabic language, but it doesn't mean that Arabs or Muslims are the owner of this halal word or a halal rule or a halal certification. One disclaimer I have. Oh, the, I have been 
told that slides are not being changed. So sorry for this interruption, but how to do this? Okay, slide is being changed. Thank you very much for informing me. Okay, if, uh, we go with the words of halal and the meaning of halal. First is, as I mentioned, this is uh, coming from Arabic word, but it doesn't mean that Muslims or Arab people are the owner of this word or this law. This law has been introduced to humanity through Al-Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of us uh, in our life. The meaning is of this uh, word is lawful, permissible, allowed as per certain law. And then we usually use the terminology allowed according to the Islamic law. And these are the not only the things we eat or we consume in our life, but it is also the actions we do on an everyday basis. Meaning is <clears throat> what kind of law is necessary for human beings or what kind of uh, position of human beings are. We have the two positions in this world. One is uh, we are the machines. Uh, we perf perform or operate similar as the car operates or as the iPhone operates as the computer operates. And we also have a, another position what we call it uh, ourselves as the animal. What is the difference of other animals and we animals that we have two positions. First of all, it is we are the animals who are social animals. We have interaction with another uh, animals. We have talking, sleeping, talk, uh, marrying, having children. Then we go out to work. We also have a, uh, jobs. We have businesses. We have contracts. So those kind of animals, we are social animals. As a machine, uh, our position is like an iPhone or a computer, but it's only small difference, but it's a very big difference in, in other words. That computer or iPhone cannot move from one place to another place, even if it is battery, its battery is fully charged. But in case of human being, we are that kind of machine which has Allah has given us the ability uh, to walk, to think, to talk, to make a decision by ourselves or even to search the knowledge by ourselves to to go around and to do the things to activities <clears throat> which run our life and in interaction with other uh, machines also the human beings which are living in our society we call them another machines also so the engineer of this machine is allah almighty and allah almighty has told us that uh, why he knew us in advance because he is our engineer so all engineers in advance knows uh, how this machine will operate the, so they give us operating instruction manual to operate uh, these all kind of machines like i will keep on giving example of iphone now iphone is a kind of machine which is uh, very recently came to our life and when we were using the old type of phone and then we changed to the uh, touch screen phones, those touch screen phones, uh, we didn't know how to operate. So we every single step whenever we have taken in the very beginning, uh, we use the operating instruction manual of iPhones. Similarly, the human being uh, needs also the rules and laws to operate this machine. Allah subhanahu wa is our engineer and he uh, written Al-Quran as an operating instruction manual of a human machine and because he know our psychology, our physiology, our, uh, our status in the society as a social animal 
And he also knew that we have a lot of curiosity in our mind. He also knew in advance that when we will be living in this world in a billion numbers, then there will be a lot of Muslims, a lot of non-Muslims. So those, everybody should perform <clears throat> uh, how they should behave or how they should perform as a machine, as an animal. And Allah Almighty has given us uh, this uh, operating instruction manual in the shape of Al-Quran. Now, uh, we go to the next slide. But before that, let me uh, mention this two very important factor is that when we say it is lawful, usually Muslim people translate this lawful as a as per Islamic law. Definitely that is as per Islamic law. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this law uh, or this understanding that how to behave if there is any law. For human society, for human members, uh, society members, there must be all kind of laws and there must be human being who should behave or who should, uh, what do you call, work according to the laws. So having the law and then performing the law, both are equally important. If somebody have the law, or any society have the law, but they do not follow the law, it doesn't mean th there is no value of having that law. But if somebody uh, having the law and then they behave or perform, or follow that law, then the society will get better. Uh, I give you an example of a small child, like let's say two or three years old child. This two or three years old child is a purely a representative of a human being who is free to decide, who is free to think, who is free to move. And if an adult asks him to sit in a room where there is a computer, where there is a, a water, so this child will definitely not sit on the seat for a longer time. He will tell to that he will start moving and thinking that what should I do and he, he will take a water and put on the computer. It doesn't mean that he want to destroy the computer, but it means that he want to learn what will happen if I put the water on the computer or if I throw the computer from the, the table to the floor, what will happen. So to gain the knowledge, which is Allah SWT has put in the curiosity in the human being, to gain the knowledge, uh, all human beings, small children are big, everybody want to learn and they do certain experiments. So when they do certain experiments start to, to gain the knowledge, there are certain things which is allowed for them, there are certain things which is not allowed for them. And Allah SWT prohibited those things to us, is same like a father prohibit the child that uh, you can drink the water, but you do not throw the water on the computer. So if you will throw the computer uh, water on the computer, the computer will break. So because human being don't know, so he want to get a trial. So if he will do the trial, he will destroy the machine. And sometimes this is a simple example of water and computer. But then there are certain other times when human being will do the thing which is dangerous for himself. Meaning is sometimes we climb the trees or climb the buildings and then we fall down and we break our legs. So those things are not allowed basically to do that, but we do and then accidents happen. And similarly, if uh, there is a law in any country, uh, non-Muslim country even, that uh, you have to follow all the laws until, uh, unless those laws do not go against any Islamic values. Meaning is that like government of Japan has made a law that you, when you are driving a car, you must have a driving license. And then if a red signal is there, you have to stop it. So this law is for to protect us, not to protect the government only, not to protect the lawmakers only. But this is for all human beings living in that society. So if one human being do not follow the law and he try to cross the red signal while driving a car, so from the other side, a, a bicycle will come and hit the car. And let's say there is no big damage happened to the personality or person both on the bicycle or in the car but it can break the light. Once it breaks the light, you have to buy the light to, to run the car. So if you have to buy the light, uh, that will directly affect your economy. Meaning is if it is like 10,000 yen, I mean $100, $200 light. So you have to spend $100, $200 out of your bucket to buy that light. So if 
uh, your income is you are very rich then it's very good but there are most of the time our incomes are very limited once our incomes are very limited and this light kind of things broken happen when we buy the light this uh, $100 $200 is very expensive or very heavy on our economy our every month economy because our all salary go for taking care of our bills house food children education many many things are there to uh, to cover from our salary so if we do not uh, perform properly as per law and then our light is broken then we have to buy the light this is heavy on our economy this what we'll do in result is that we will break another law meaning is uh, we will lie to somebody to get that money or we will cheat or we will do bribery or we will do something something illegal we will do to get those extra 10,000, 20,000 yen or 100, 200 dollar to buy this light. So this is uh, about halal law. It's not only a religious law. It is to live in the society. Secondly, as I said, it's not only things like food and water and cosmetics, but this is also the actions we do perform on everyday basis. Meaning is like we do a contract with another companies. We perform a promises with another companies. So we, we really, uh, every single day from wake up till night, every single second, we have to perform our life as per law. So if we go a little bit out of the law, then something big damage can happen to our economy, to our life, to our physical body, to something uh, damage will happen. So Allah SWT knew in advance that how human being will behave. That is why Allah Almighty uh, told us that follow the law of that country, that place, that company, that factory, uh, that area, that uh, society, wherever you are living in. And whatever the, law, the laws has been made, that is actually laws are made to protect you. So halal is one of that kind of law that uh, if the child keep uh, the water and for only drinking, that is halal for him. But if the child throw the water on the computer, that is not halal for him. It's a very simple uh, idea or concept. Uh, only unfortunately, we, the Muslims, uh, have explained in a way uh, to all human beings that this is Islamic law and it's only about slaughter, animal, or uh, what do we call that, food, or halal mark food, or those kind of things. If somebody is earning a non-halal income, and then he go and buy the halal mark food, that halal mark food will never happen to halal. So we have to understand the basic, basic, very basic concept of halal from Islamic point of view and uh, other than from Islamic point of view, uh, we the <clears throat> human being of that society always uh, really care and worry, uh, then the things go, will go proper. Now in my life, I have uh, almost 27, 28 years experience of Pakistan life and similarly I have 24 years experience of Japan life. So what I have seen is that in Japan, those machines, which I mentioned the human beings, those machines, they follow the law. 100% they follow the law. The, unfortunately, the machines in Pakistan, they are very free animals or they're free to decide by themselves. There is an Islamic law. There is a country law also. I mean, the hum, uh, Allah made law and human made law are both in Pakistan. So if both uh, things are in Pakistan, if we follow that properly, our economy will get better. I tell you in 1960s, not 60s, but 1961, 960, Japan economy and Pakistan economy was almost similar. There was a time when we have borrowed, uh, lended the money to Germany. So we were very rich uh, at that time. What happened in the way, I really think of last 20 years in Jap living in Japan that why Japanese has made their country a beautiful country, but why Pakistan uh, going down economy-wise, GDP-wise, the system-wise, everything. So I realized that the Japanese machines, they are the one who follow the law, and the Pakistani machines, they are the one who do not follow the law, do not like to follow the law. So how the laws are being made in Islam, or we call it Sharia law, <clears throat> what is basically the meaning of Sharia? Meaning of Sharia is, is a law, is a constitution, is a is a way of life. If somebody tell you that you have to stop the red signal, and if you stop on the red signal, that is you are following the Sharia law. 
if uh, you do not stop on the red signal, means you are breaking the Sharia law of the country and Allah made rules as well. So how these laws are being made is, first of all, is a basis of Quran. This is a basic of Islam and in all countries, Muslim, non-Muslim, who are doing the halal certification, these are the basics of those uh, rules and regulations. So if somebody understands this basic uh, principle of halal certification inshallah uh, wherever you go whichever the country you go all are same now the al-quran is the topmost thing which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, given to us and then again i will say that uh, it's not only a religious book it is a religious book but it is not only a religious book because a religion is a thing in all over the world there are many religions if you go there is a concept, there is a human being, there is a prophet, there is a God. And then God asks human being to do certain things, then human being have to do that. This is called religious life. And there is something called secular life, which is has nothing to do with the religion. All, all the atheist people, those people who do not believe in any God, they also have to follow the similar system and law. What is that is actually that uh, a simple thing, do not lie. In, in any society, do not lie or do not break a contract is, a, is for Muslim, for non-Muslim, for believer, for non-believer, for atheist, everybody will say that do not lie or do not break a contract. So uh, Al-Quran is a kind of uh, book God has given us. It is a combination of the religious thing as well as the secular things. So those secular rules and regulations what God has made and what human has made. Whatever the human has made, there are many weaknesses or there are many improvements needed in those laws and regulations. But whatever God has made for a human being, this will remain same forever. For example, Al-Quran is the book which has been revealed 1,400 years before in Arab country. And then the Muslims of that people or the human being of that people, they follow the rules and regulation of Al-Quran so it doesn't mean that, that when that era will finish, uh, would have been finished, then the newcomers no need to follow those rules and regulation. This book has been uh, designed or written on the basis of psychology of a human being. Like how human being will behave, how he will work, how he will do business, how he will marry, how he will eat food, how he will drink things, how he will, uh, when, in 2020 will come then the human being will go around the world without any boundaries without any difficulties without any breakage without any uh, limitations so meaning is that now we are living in a global village at that time in 1400 years before the arabs were living in a very limited small area so suppose any book uh, if it is a simple book the style is that that book life is very short meaning is very nice, very nice book goes longer than longer is 100 years, 150 years or very rare some books go very long time. But this Al-Quran is as fresh in 2020 as it was in uh, first time came to the human being. So the purpose of this book and the method of this book to give in to us is by our engineer who knows how this machine will behave or perform. So he has given the different kind of rules and laws in our life. And if you go to the Al-Quran book, it's not only about uh, uh, talking about Jannah and Jahannam only, but mostly it is talking about how the society should live in this world, how the uh, society should behave in this world, how the human beings, when, for example, my kind of person who is originally from Pakistan, living in Japan uh, in a non-Muslim country is a Buddhist country or a Hindu country or is a Christian country, it doesn't matter. So when I'm living here, I have to do or interact business with other uh, people. Some of them will be Christian, some of them will be Jew, some of them will be atheist. So how I should behave in this life, uh, how I should really perform nicely that I should not disturb the society. I should not really, uh, uh, what do you call the valuable to the society, whatever my religion is and whatever the person to whom I'm interacting with. So Al-Quran is really based on this kind of knowledge. 
that uh, if we, the human beings, I, I give example to Japanese people, there is an island of 1,000 people only living. So I said, give the Al-Quran to those 1,000 people. Do not tell them no need to be converted to Islam. Just whatever is written in Al-Quran, start behaving and performing like that. So what will be the end result of that? That that 1,000 people will feel very happy, very like, like what we call the, our end target of human being is what? When we go to work, we earn salaries, we earn money. Is this money, paper money or the cash money or the credit card is our end target of life? No. Our target is that maybe with this money we can buy a house, we can buy a car, we can buy things, uh, a lot of things we can buy. Uh, and then is this our target to buy the house and the car is our end target? No. Our target is if the, I will have the house or if I will have the car or if I can have money to buy the ticket to go outside the country, then my life will be happy. So the end target is to be happy. And Al-Quran teaches you how to be happy without earning money or whatever the earning money you earn, how if you share with other human beings who are needy people, then it will be very, very helpful for you as well as for the society. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given four things in our hand, in our control. One is our time, one is our money, one is our love, one is our care. So if we start giving these four things to other human beings, the society will be very happy without money, even, without food, even, without clothing, without shelter. It's a very unfortunate concept of all human beings that is a, everybody becomes selfish that I want to earn more money, I want to earn more money. So in this case, we are destroying our society. While Quran teaches us that share your money with others, uh, you will be happy more. Similarly, uh, Quran teaches us be kind to your parents when they are old. So meaning is, it's not only that Pakistani parents should be kind, the children should be kind to the Pakistani parents, or the uh, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, people should be kind to their old parents. Actually, it's a psychology of a human being that when these people become old, 60, 65, 70 years old, in their past life, they are very busy in their work. They are very hardworking people in their work. But what happened is after retirement, they have nothing to do. So they become like, uh, what do you call, agitated in the, uh, in the home. So they start uh, getting angry to their children without any reason. Really, there is no particular reason. Like a simple cup of tea is there and your father will enter say, oh, why is this cup of tea is here? So point is that when father say, why this cup of tea is here, you please don't get angry back to uh, your father. Why? Because there was a time when this father have served you a lot. You are unable to put the food in your mouth or the water in your mouth, but this father has given you, uh, or this mother has given you a lot of service. So now when this father and mother become old, now it is requested to you that you become uh, kind. So the point is that Quran is not the book of religion who teaches you only to go to Jannah, but it teaches you how to live this life in this world. Once you follow the Quranic principles and you start learning and you start behaving and you start performing in your life and you become the valuable to the other human beings, you will see that Jannah and Jahannam is a result of this world, whatever the life we live here. So my uh, really understanding of Al-Quran is like that. I take Al-Quran not as a religious book, but as, as an operating instruction manual of my body, or my society, or my people, my wife, my children, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, my colleagues, my company people, everybody is like uh, really uh, kind of <clears throat> I have to perform every every action of my life, every second of my life, every milli and nanosecond of my life as per Islamic uh, uh, Quranic rules, then everything will be perfect, inshallah. Now it comes to the hadith. Hadith is the kind of thing that Quran said, sometimes Quran requests or guide or advice to perform certain duties, which if Allah subhanahu wa has given to any angel, an angel will perform those duties. But later the human beings of 2020 comes and they say, oh, that was the angel, that is why he could perform. We are not the angels, we cannot do that thing, but he could do that. So that is why uh, God has given this 
operating instruction manual to one human being and ask that human being that you perform this and show to people, uh, then nobody can complain that uh, he was a simple human being. He, if he could perform, I can also perform. So that is why the, whatever the Rasulullah has performed in his life, it is a very simple human life. He has done uh, marrying, eating food, and going to the life like Syria, like Yemen to do businesses. So it was a very, very common life any human being can live. Only it looks like he was very poor or he didn't have money. So this poorness was actually not by by force. He was a very good businessman. Uh, before profit would come to him, he was going to uh, import and export business from uh, Syria to Yemen through Mecca and Medina. So he was a good businessman. And good businessman has the ability to earn money whatever the age of life he would be. But he learned through Al-Quran that uh, to give your uh, money, extra money, to others is the best. Keep your necessities with you and give to uh, remaining to the others. Uh, so then now the necessities definition is person to person varies. Like somebody want to have one house, somebody person, person want to have one car, and another person want to have two cars and two houses. So each person can have this. This is the uh, one of the difficult thing I, I always talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that uh, sometime in our life, uh, when we see that the government of Japan has make a law to drive a car on the road and then red signal is there and then to to perform this role, law properly, they make a police also. And after the police, they make a jail also. And after the jail, they make a bigger jail also. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the Quranic law for us, for human being, he did not make any police for us. He did not make any jail for us in this world. He given all the authority and power in our hand that you are the one who uh, think you are the one who decide by yourself. This is the Quran tell you that you earn money, you keep necessities for you, and then just you give to the others to share, share, your, share, share your, all the money with others. Now it is dependent upon you that what is your definition of necessities. So if you keep the necessities really limited to, very limited to your limited house, limited food, limited car, limited transportation and limited other luxuries. In that case, you are performing uh, the life as per Quran and Hadith. And then it comes to the Ijma. It, what is Ijma is? Ijma is actually the Islam is a very natural religion. Natural mean, uh, let's say if you can perform in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, which is a Muslim uh, populated country, if once you come to Japan, then you cannot perform this religion properly. So mean this, there is something wrong with this religion. This is not a natural. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a system for all the human beings that whichever the time period you are, and whichever the country you are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us certain relaxations. So those relaxations you use with the discussions, with the knowledge based on Quran and Hadith, and then you make the new law as per your time and as per your era, whichever you are living in, as per your country where you are living in. So similarly, in Pakistan, there are certain Islamic laws are very strict. When you come to Japan, those similar Islamic laws become a little bit soft. Uh, <clears throat> then it comes to the Qiyas. Qiyas is actually based on the Quran and Hadith, your own decision of uh, like, whenever we go to J Japanese market, there are certain drinks, uh, which is not so clear that what is this? And then I ask somebody, what is this? They say it's a green tea. So then I have the ability to decide by myself on the basis of Al-Quran and Hadith that I can uh, drink this without this discussion with any, doing any ijma on this or asking any alim on this that should I do drink or this or not. So we have the ability to uh, think by our own self. Now, uh, I give you an example uh, how we make the law in, in this on food, food industry basis or the cosmetic industry basis. There are three types of alcohols. I'm sure many of you are food scientists today. I have seen the list. So many of you are aware that there are three major types of alcohols. One alcohol is called, which is coming from uh, drinking alcohol or it can make you drunk. In Arabic terminology, we call it khamar. So khamar is a kind of alcohol. Actually, it's not al because of alcohol, it is haram, but because 
it is hummer that alcohol become hummer easy to drink and if you drink you become drunk then it become haram so if you go directly to al quran al quran will tell you that hummer is haram you are not allowed to drink so uh, then the, there are second type of alcohol is there which is called uh, natural production in uh, let's say vinegar or soy sauce or those kind of th- certain things in our life uh, we use as our spices for our foods and in japan we have those kind of things that are a lot actually that fermented products are there so in that natural production of alcohol happen so what is islam is saying about that if you go to al quran there is nothing mentioned in that uh, what to do with this kind of alcohol but then if you go to hadith we found out that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a habitual to eat the vinegar so production of vinegar also has natural production of alcohol so if rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was using that for his life mean this is allowed to use in our life as well now come to the third type of alcohol which is uh, ethanol are uh, usually used for disinfectants in different countries in different industry and nowadays particularly it is uh, getting famous because of covid-19 the disinfection of hands you can use that alcohol now uh, these three type of alcohol if you see the as only the alcohol chemical this alcohol chemical there are t- two terminologies in islam one is called najis one is called tahir so the ulama has given the fatwa on this alcohol which is ethanol alcohol pure alcohol is 65 to 95% purity coming from sugar cane or coming from other uh, fermentation of the things but used only for disinfectant so this type of alcohol is called tahir so only the najis alcohol is the one which is coming from uh, a, a kind of drink which is not only a drink but it become khamar as well so the khamar drink alcohol is is najis other alcohols are tahir so uh, this is how in islam we go through the different uh, type of rule making process and then uh, we uh, make the law alhamdulillah this is the way and it's a very proper way like now ethanol is a new terminology a new product coming to our life like 100 years 200 years before so muslim have the ability to uh, use that for our uh, everyday life inshallah it is not a problem a uh, lot of perfumes are using that a lot of uh, flavors are using that so flavors alcohol is also halal inshallah and then this uh, perfume alcohol is also halal inshallah how al quran is uh, teaching us uh, about haram matters there are four things mentioned in this ayah of uh, sorry this i have mentioned in the japanese characters are mentioned the surah bakra ayah number 173 so in this case uh, al quran has this particular ayah has uh, uh, three portions first portion is mentioning four things uh, dead meat blood pork and any halal animal slaughtered by the name of any other god except allah so that uh, thing will not be halal but the second portion says that if you do not have uh, halal food to eat and it is your life threatening situation is coming then you can eat this uh, non halal things as well now the last portion of this ayah is very important which says that allah is so kind allah is so loving meaning is that the purpose of allah to stop consuming these products is not that Uh, there is some benefit of god in this case or there is some some kind of religious thing is there that is why god is prohibiting you it is nothing like that these things are not good and not healthy for us for human beings that is why god has prohibited us to uh, consume those things in our life and if today i don't have the time inshallah if, if i get in future next time i will explain to you every single details of why dead meat is not halal why blood is not halal why pork is not halal and if pork is not halal why allah subhanahu wa has created pig i have another full presentation on this topic and this the last one which is the fourth one that any halal animal slaughtered by the name of any other god except allah this is also a scientific thing usually we consider that as a uh, 
this is a religious thing, purely religious thing, because this is God, meat is something related to God actually. But no, this is uh, related to that animal who is going to be slaughtered. So that is why these four things are being prohibited. <coughs> and we have to care about those things and ensure you will see that uh, our life become more cleaner and cleaner. Like for example, I give example to Japanese people we, on the same table, me as a Muslim and another person who is Japanese eating pork and I'm not eating pork. So it's not that when a person who eats the pork that will make God as weaker. And if I do not eat the pork, then God, it, it will make God uh, stronger, nothing. The person who eats the pork, not reducing the value of God at all. The person who not eating the pork, not giving any added value to God. So God, Alhamdulillah, is clean from us. He is Samad. He has nothing to do. So what if this food will go to our stomach, that food will go to our blood, the blood will go to each part of our body and that will disturb our our life, our health, our sickness, all to, comes from those kind of things. That is why we are definitely uh, think that when God is guiding us through Al-Quran, this is not because God wants any kind of his hidden agenda, but this is for us, we the human beings uh, have to get benefit or have to get loss from this kind of uh, things. Now this uh, next is very important slide for me actually. Uh, I definitely want you to understand this is that you would have seen or you have met or you have known certain number of people in Islamic countries or uh, certain Muslims who go other countries, they see Muslims are drinking alcohol or uh, doing some other haram thing. So, so what is this uh, taqwa related to halal is that those people who have more taqwa in their life, they will take care of halal in their life. This is a very straightforward rule. So now, uh, what is taqwa? I was asking or searching this question from many of my friends, what is taqwa? You know, I asked one of the Arab guys that please uh, teach me what is taqwa. And whatever he has taught me, that thing really has changed my life. What was that is that uh, when you want to make somebody happy, like usually when we say taqwa or any terminology coming in Al-Quran, we directly relate to the God actually. But imagine that before Rasulullah the Arabic language was everyday life language of those Arab people. So when those Arab Arabic terminologies, when those Arabic terminologies are being used in Al-Quran, those Arab people really catch it, really understand it, really comprehend it, and then they right away start using it in their life because they really understand what is going on. What is the meaning of taqwa? Well, usually we, uh, when we see the translation of uh, <clears throat> of taqwa in Al Quran in English or in Urdu language or in other languages, it usually says Mudallil Mutakin. This book is hidaya for those who have taqwa, or those who feel fear of God, or those who uh, like Parhezgar in Urdu language. So all those things we really don't understand. Or even Pakistanis don't understand what is the meaning of Parhezgar. And uh, we don't understand really what is the meaning of feeling fear of this thing. The, the, my Arab friend who explained to me what is feeling fear mean is that uh, when uh, I love someone, let's say first of all, I love Allah SWT very much inshallah ta'ala, and all of you would have loved Allah SWT or even some non-Muslim uh, people are, if they are here, uh, maybe they love their God as well too. In our case, we, we, when we say to love to God, we really don't understand basically, we, we, this do not enter in our heart and soul, what is the meaning of that? So that is why, to, just to create an example, I bring back down here to the, our earth, uh, when we deal with our uh, parents, let's say I love my father very much, I love my mother very much, I love my wife very much, I love my children very much. So I will try my best to make them happy. When I, How I will make them happy is, for example, to my parents, I will iron their clothes, or I'll bring towel to them, or prepare their food, or prepare their uh, things, and very happy to polish their shoes for my parents. And secondly, uh, for my wife, maybe I will cook for her, maybe I'll wash dishes for her. So all those things when I'm doing this, if I do because I'm scared of my father or mother or my wife, 
this feeling of beauty will not be there. The feeling of love will not be there. So, but if on the other hand, I have to clean the house because I love my wife or I love my parents, then the, the feeling will be very beautiful. Like I will enjoy doing cleaning of the house like this. So if my love level increase and increase and increase, that the time comes one day that or one time I, it comes in my life that I start feeling fear in my heart that if I will not clean the house, probably, I'd say use big probably, that probably my father will not be happy. Or probably my mother will not be happy. Or probably my wife will not be happy. So this feeling of fear is called taqwa. And those nations, those human beings who have this feeling of fear of this taqwa love for others, the result of the love is that kind of taqwa if for others, then whatever they produce in their life, whatever the work they do, whatever the quality of work they have as an office worker, as a driver, as a truck driver, as a, you know, what do you call that, uh, uh, office colleague, as an engineer, as a food scientist, as a uh, religious ustad, whoever, whatever the job they'll do, they will feel so beauty in their job. And people who will watch them, they will also enjoy that working. That wow, this is thing. Working with Japanese people, I learned that the engineers of uh, Toyota and engineers of Lexus, what is the difference of their quality of work is this taqwa base only. That engineers of Lexus have more higher taqwa for their clients. Now, when they make a car, the car of Lexus and Toyota is very much similar. 99.999% is similar. Same car, same engine, same door, same everything, same, same, same. But only the quality is that so high level that it shows that the engineer who has made Lexus, their taqwa was higher for the human being, for the, their clients. So that is why they make. Now, Japanese people call their clients as God. There is one proverb in Japanese language that a client is a God. If a Japanese engineer, human being, have that high taqwa level to his client God, uh, that he make a very high quality car. In this case, you can imagine that we, the Muslim people, we, the one who love Allah subhanahu wa very much, our taqwa to Allah subhanahu wa should be very, very high level. Why? Because in this case, we will be worrying always, we will be caring always, we will be thinking always, I should not do anything in my life, which maybe, maybe Allah will not be happy. And that halal food or halal life uh, is one of that. That if I myself is doing something which is I know that Allah SWT has not permitted me to do that. And there are certain other things that this previous ayah I have told you that Allah even has permitted me that say if you are in Japan and there is no halal food, you can eat not halal, non halal food is also you can eat. But when I go to, I'm hungry so much and I go to supermarket and I see there is a small rice boil, ball and I see there is a emulsifier in that. And then I say, oh, I should not eat that because my Allah will, maybe my Allah will not be happy. Although Allah is allowing me to eat it. So now there is a, in our life, there is a law. There are so many things which is, we, we should live according to the law. Then above law is love. Above law, very high level of above law is love. So if we perform our life every day basis on the basis of this result of love, inshallah, you will see that we definitely will live a life which is Allah SWT has guided us and that will make us able to go to Jannah directly. So the result of this life will bring us to the halal life and halal life will bring us to, uh, to Jannah kind of things. Jannah means heaven. I, I also use sim similar thing for the non-Muslim, non-believers. They have the decision and they have the uh, decision power to decide by themselves that who will be their God. So I have no authority to guide them in this case. The point here is that taqwa is a very, very important factor to do things, to choose things, to make things uh, as high quality as uh, you can so that your client, your, your client will be happy, your wife will be happy, your father, mother will be happy. So through this human being, your Allah will be happy, inshallah. <clears throat> We go to the next slide now. This is what Allah SWT explained about taqwa. 
de esta cosa es like Allah, you know that we pray towards Kaaba or Qibla. So Allah here explained to you very nicely in a very easy and soft way that you pray towards east or west or north or south, I don't care. What do I care is what is in your heart? Are you in love with me or not? Are you really caring about me or not? So if you are caring about me, then there are certain mistakes you will do in, in your prayer or your direction will be not proper or you, maybe your wudu will not be proper, maybe your something will not be fit, but I will forgive you. So this is the point, very important point is that taqwa is not only about rules and regulation, it is above rules and regulation, which is about love. <clears throat> now we come to the next stage where uh, halal, there are, uh, why uh, halal certification is necessary? You know, like 50, 60, 70 years ago, there was no halal certification. So it means that Muslims of that time were not eating halal. It's not like that. It is, uh, it is that we, the human being of today's era, have to eat a lot, a lot of processed foods or processed things which become a little bit difficult to get their traceability. In past, like my, I remember my grandfather who was living in the village, so whatever he eat, it was from his own farm. Wheat was his own, maize was his own, chicken was his own, beef was his own, milk was his own. So he knew the traceability of the food very well. Meaning is that halal in Muslim life or in, in this our terminology, halal is clear. It's very clear. You need not to worry about that many things like vegetables, if it is grown in your own farm and you know what feed you have given to those vegetables, it's very clear. So no need to worry about too much. Uh, it is uh, halal inshallah. Then water, if you are taking from the river, it is halal. You need not to have any halal, kind of halal certification. Now the next stage, we, when we go to haram, this is also very clear. Mesa, uh, I have read one ayah in front of you very few things are haram, very, very few things are haram if it is a straightforward coming in our hand. Like a pork is hala, uh, haram for us. <coughs> when somebody poked a pork meat in front of us, we will say, no, no, sorry, I don't want to eat this. It's very clear. The thing which is more confusing or difficult and Allah SWT has prohibited us to consume is that call is, in Arabic language is called shubha or doubtful. Doubtful is when we say about a food, what is doubtful is that when you go to the supermarket, there are a lot of processed foods are there. And I have seen many of us are here, the food scientists. These food scientists are, we are the one who uh, create the recipes and we are the one who, who trying to create a kind of situation where the food should be cheaper, our food look great, our food should have emulsifier to make it faster, or uh, it looks like oil and water should be mixed properly or bread should be this kind of thing and cookies should be that kind of thing. So those things all become doubtful. And Allah SWT has guided us not to consume the doubtful things. Now, if I tell you about the food only, many of the Muslims around the world are Japanese people around the world, are Americans, are Africans, are whoever, human beings, they are not very much worried about that. Even in the you know, Halal Research Council, if you see there is one, you should make yourself able to read the label. So, but even then there are a lot of uneducated people are there who cannot read the labels. What should they do? So the point is what Allah SWT is guiding you, that you should not consume the doubtful things. You should not consume the shubha things. So, okay, what is the procedure to, to, to check, uh, the to make the clear doubtful things? Let's say, I have seen one emulsifier uh, on one of the label in Pakistan or in India or in Nigeria or in somewhere or another countries, wherever I go to eat, I see certain thing has the label of emulsifier. Now certain emulsifier as a food scientist, I know, but there are certain other emulsifier as a food scientist if, uh, having a PhD also, I don't know what are those things. So to if I call that company, 
let's say I'm in Dubai and I call the company manufacturers in Japan. So how do we, they will reply me that this is really, maybe I will be connected to the importer of that product, but still they will not able to explain to me. They'll ask me, okay, wait, we will reply you. But still there are certain points they will not explain to me. They say, sorry, we, like Japanese style is, they say, are you eating for allergy or for religious purpose? If I say religious purpose, right away they say, please don't eat. Uh, it's not good for you. Now they don't want to go to the traceability level. So what happened is that if I uh, go as a normal consumer and knock the door of the factory, please show me your documents. I want to see what is this emulsifier type is. Still, company will not show me their secret. But if as an auditor of a halal certification or organic certification or uh, ISO certification or HACCP certification, if I go there, I would have a privacy contract signed already. So then the company will open their uh, stomach in front of me and put all the documents in front of me. So I could see the traceability of the documents and traceability of the ingredients. And once I know the traceability of ingredients, possibilities are two. One is that that emulsifier was containing uh, uh, pig source material. So I will say this is haram. So meaning is that shubha type of thing is finished, now it become clear and become haram. But on the other possibility is that when I see they say it's a soya lassi thing and nothing is the issue. So I'll say, okay, the doubtful thing is gone and now this is halal. So the purpose of halal certification is to get the traceability of ingredients, procedure, process in the factory, cleanliness of the factory, the quality control in the factory and then I issue the halal certificate that now not only you are clean from ingredients but your quality is also reasonable that you should get the halal and tayyiban certificate and uh, this uh, the doubtful thing is gone. So the purpose of basic purpose of halal certification is to make the uh, doubtful thing clear. Now you see this that why doubtful thing has been prohibited to us. The reason behind this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know already that if we will eat the doubtful things, the doubtful diseases can come to our body. Meaning is what? That nowadays our very common doubtful disease is what? It's a cancer. So if somebody has the cancer and you go to the doctor, doctor will uh, first of all will know that you have the cancer and they will treat you. They, for example, it is in the arm or in the leg. So they will cut the leg or cut the arm and the cancer will be gone. But nobody ever until now knows or understands that from where this cancer is coming. Why? Because our food cannot be traceable for the last 20 years. Unfortunately, nobody has a record that we have, whatever we have eaten in the last 20 years is a very clear food we have eaten. So all of us, even in Pakistan or Islamic countries or other uh, non-Islamic country doesn't matter nowadays is all these countries are global village so every single country is using the processed foods which is not clear and those not clear things can create uh, cancer in our body which is not clear disease actually so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew this in advance that is why he has prohibited us that do not consume any kind of doubtful thing now this doubtful thing if you go to the food and cosmetics only Maybe you will say, okay, from tomorrow on, I will not eat. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala go more details. Allah didn't say, do not eat doubtful food. Allah said, do not consume anything doubtful in your life. Meaning is what? That if I'm standing outside in uh, somewhere in my street or a station and somebody, unknown person come to me and he give a lot of money in, in the back briefcase, that this money all I give you. I don't know that person. I don't know what is this money is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited me they do not use this money or do not trust on that person. On the other hand, I go to outside and I have the promise yesterday with the ABC person that tomorrow we will meet on blah, blah place and you will bring this much amount of money and we will do business together. Now that person is also not doubtful. It's a clear person. Similarly, that, that uh, money is also not doubtful. So both things are traceability is possible. The human being is traceable, the money is traceable. So if I use that, inshallah, there is no possibility of accident can happen. But if I use a non, uh, 
traceable money in my life. Possibility is that if I get the briefcase, after five minutes, police come and catch me. Oh, this is a, a stolen money from blah, blah place. So that is why Allah SWT is asking us, do not use the doubtful thing. So the purpose of halal certification is always is to clear the doubtful things. <coughs> I hope all of my brothers, sisters, whichever the country you are from, you are following this all situation, what I'm trying to teach. Today's teaching is a big word. I'm trying to share my knowledge with all of you. Now this is a, a halal mark. Why the halal mark is important? That as I mentioned to you just now, the emulsifier things is a doubtful thing. And I saw in the product and then as a uh, halal auditor, I went to the company and I see that this uh, emulsifier, what they were using is halal. It's no issue at all. So uh, I can issue them a halal certificate. So when I issue them the halal certificate, until the time this company do not put the halal mark on their product, how the normal consumers will understand that this product is halal or not halal. Even the product is halal, even the product is halal certified. But until the time, this halal mark is not on the product, the product is still doubtful. So to finish the doubtfulness of the product after an auditor has been checked the factory and after an auditor has been checked the procedure and the cleanliness and the quality control and all those things, then the auditor said, okay, this product is halal. Now it is this halal mark has containing like if you see the different, a lot of different countries, first of all, any halal mark of the world will have this Arabic word halal. Why? Because all over the world, Muslim people educated or non-educated. They go to masjids or musallas or, uh, or madrasas to learn Al-Quran. Once they learn Al-Quran, they can read the word of halal. And somewhat, somehow, they really understand the meaning of uh, what is uh, halal. So sometimes, the Muslim people very feel very happy when they see this halal mark. So Arabic word is important. The design of this, the color of this, halal mark is not important at all. So all over the world, people have different designs. All over the world, people have different uh, colors. But the one word of Arabic halal is always there in the halal mark. And seventh, cent, cent, second thing is, the pro the, with this mark, the product guarantees its traceability, meaning is there is an uh, unspoken word between a con company who is producing food, the halal auditor who has checked, halal certification body who has issued the certificate, and the consumer. These three triangle, they understand that somebody has checked, somebody has produced, and now I can uh, take it without any doubt and without any worries. So this product also becomes safe for consumption. So there's somebody, third party has checked for me and I went to the company. There was no dirty company. There was no like uh, illegal things being used or harmful things being used in this. So even the non-Muslim countries like Singapore, like Thailand, the non-Muslim people like to eat the halal certified food. Why? Because this awareness has been given to them that halal certified food is more safe or more pure, more trustable. Why? Because somebody has gone to that company or, uh, to replace you. You cannot go to each company, but somebody has went to that company, check for you that this product is really trustable, so you can eat. So it also create a trustable food, a safety uh, food also it gives you. Now when we go to the uh, next slide, there are so many, I, just example I give you. The halal marks are there, four company, uh, countries halal marks are there. Uh, Indonesia, very famous halal mark is there. Malaysia, also very famous. So Singapore. Why these three countries halal mark I put here? Because if you see all these three, the design is a complicated one. Uh, colors are so many different. The, some Arabic living, written there, English written there. But the world of Arabic halal is in each halal mark. So the in the whole world, people say, uh, halal certification is not one, but if you see this halal mark, in a way, this is a one. Why? Because every single uh, company or certification body uh, allow this uh, Arabic one to uh, put the halal. 
uh, in their product. Now I will go to a little bit of a science background of science behind halal certification. As I mentioned to you, the really this is purely a traceable halal food. Halal food is a traceable food. Meaning is what? That if you will go to uh, see any halal certified product, every single ingredients being used in that product, you can trace until their base. It comes uh, from farm to table. Farm to table mean that in the farm, somebody has produced vegetables uh, and in the farm, they produce the cows and uh, buffaloes and chicken and everything. And once they uh, slaughter these things, these animals, and they mix with the vegetables and they produce something, a new thing. Uh, let's say they produce the bread from uh, wheat and in the bread, they use the, uh, what do you call the amino acids uh, coming from uh, cysteine and cysteine, which is possibilities of human hair. Possibilities, uh, it is coming from uh, bird feathers. So if it is a human hair, you will know if it, there is a halal mark is there, you know that human hair uh, cysteine is not being used in this. But if you are uh, seeing this halal mark is there, you will say, oh, this is a bird feather. So now you need not to go by yourself to see these bird feathers are halal or not. Those birds are not properly halal or not. Why? Because halal certification body has already checked that those birds were properly halal certified. That is why uh, this is certified. So now the animal source must be clear, plant source. In the plant source, sometimes like there are some poisonous plants are also there. Usually in the whole earth, Alhamdulillah, all the plants are safe to consume. But certain are there which consume like, a, a, let's say, poppy that flower which is being used for making cocaine or heroin. It, it will never become halal at all, no matter it is plant. And similarly, uh, if you are taking the fish as an animal uh, from the ocean, uh, that fish will be halal no matter what. It is halal, inshallah. So those kind of traceability things are being happened. Now, coming to the microbes, like for example, there are certain things, bacteria are being used for food production. Um, uh, some enzymes are being used for food production. So those enzymes and foods are also traceable if you see the halal mark food. The GMOs, usually all halal certification bodies are not allowing the GMO food and are the man-made food like like really artificial food which is not good for human uh, body or not good for human health uh, that is also not being allowed so far uh, the it's not the religious food it is a scientific food when we are talking about uh, halal certified food honestly speaking as i have seen the list of today's parties in many of your food scientists so you will understand very well that the traceable food name is halal food. It's not about religious food. So any product which is not traceable, even it is halal, we will say, no, we cannot certify that halal. So if we cannot certify that halal, that means what? That means that is, is somebody is really consuming something safe food in his or her life. Now this slide, which I'm saying, world certification bodies and accreditation bodies. Now this is the, you know, that every country has its own system of certification. Based on Al-Quran, Hadith and Ijma and Qiyas, those all basic principles has been taken care, but everybody has made their own standards. Sometimes a little bit based on Fika related matters are also there. Like somebody says Shafi has allowed this thing and Hanafi has not allowed this thing. And some somebody says Hanafi is more uh, loose and uh, Shafi is more strict, but I tell you that I have studied almost all countries' standards uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, UAE, Pakistan, Turkey. These are the major countries who are really making, like including Thailand, I will say that they're making the halal certified uh, rules and regulations. All of them are 90% and above or same. Very tiny difference comes uh, when they are talking about. Uh, slaughtering of animals, some say stunning is allowed, some say stunning is not allowed. Somebody says alcohol percentage, this much is allowed, somebody says no, no, not allowed. So these two points of slaughtering animals and alcohol percentage, they are different. Rest 
wording can be different, sentences can be different, meaning all comes from Al-Quran and Hadith. So it's almost all are same, inshallah. But you have to go through all this thing by yourself, the each country standards by yourself. Now, a new terminology came as accreditation body. Now, accreditation is what? Accreditation is actually those countries who feel that they are the buyer countries, they are the what we call ability, they have the ability to buy certain things. Uh, so then they will allow only those certification bodies come and sell to their country, which is approved by them because in, in this open field of business of halal certification, around the world there are some fake halal certification bodies that are also there. There are some non-professional halal certification bodies that are also there. So then uh, some people say, oh, my country want to buy a thing which is properly traceable food. So that is why I must see those halal certification bodies. Really, you are existing in this world or not? Are you a one-man show or not? Are you really following Islamic law or not? Do you have Muslim staff or not? Do you have Muslim procedure, SOP is proper or not? So those to see those things, there are certain accreditation bodies has been established in last uh, five, six years. It's not an old thing, I tell you. It's a very recent thing. Like Malaysia has opened a Jakim as accreditation body, MUIS, um, MUIS, Majlis Ugama Islam, Singapore, from Singapore. Uh, Thailand is CCORD, Indonesia is MUI, uh, UAE is ESMA. Uh, recently, Saudi Arabia also don't want to left behind, so they opened the SASO. Uh, the Pakistan has also the PNAC. Is their, their accreditation council. So this is kind of accreditations are there and it is good in a way, but sometimes it is not good because sometimes they charge a lot of money which certification bodies do not afford to pay. Uh, that is why unfortunately, it's, uh, this certification bodies are feeling difficulty with too much accreditation bodies and each country and each uh, con uh, system they want that my accreditation is best, my accreditation is best, follow my accreditation, I am the best. So those kind of things are there, unfortunately. Here in Japan, uh, the country do not care about religious matters, they don't get to involve in religious matters. So there are so many halal certification bodies are there, but the list I have mentioned here, uh, these are the famous halal certification bodies of uh, Japan. And I put here with the uh, year they established. So there are three, uh, Japan Muslim Association, Islamic Center Japan, Japan Islamic Trust. Those are uh, religious organizations, registered as religious organizations in Japan. And there are some non-profit organizations are these five, six, which I have mentioned here. Uh, in the messages I have seen, the, somebody was asking what is the procedure to take halal certificate and what is the fee to take the halal certificate. So from now on, I'm going to talk about how to get halal certificate. Usually, this whatever the procedure I have mentioned it here, this is general, I generalize all country system uh, and all certification bodies as much as I know. And then uh, I try to give a bigger picture. Now, when you go to the details of each, maybe they would have a different uh, kind of graph or they, they would have different kind of pattern they have shown. But the basic things they have shown like this. Meaning is what that uh, the client, in most of the countries, it is not necessary to take the halal certificate. It is a choice of the company or uh, organizations that if somebody apply for a halal certificate, then the halal certification body will move and we'll go to check that. And also the choice of halal certification body is also the choice of the company. It's not the choice of a, a, a certification body. Yes, I can promote that my certification body is better and that is not better and blah, blah, so many things. We can do backbiting, we, usually we do actually most of the time in England, in Australia, in America, in, in where, which way the part you go, Many of the halal certification bodies are doing backbiting to each other that my certification body is better and they are very bad. So unfortunately, this situation is going on, but the reality is like this. That, that somebody will contact a company that I want to get a halal certificate. Let's have a meeting, a telephone call. Let's understand what is your system going on? What is your ingredients? What is your procedure? Where is your company? How I will move there? 
uh, there are certain companies which is very clear like a very simple product like a green tea kind of thing so i, I know those things are not so difficult so i need not to have pre-ordered but there are certain uh, companies which are so complicated like cosmetics as like uh, health supplements which has a lot a lot of ingredients so i want to see that their ingredients are clear or not their line is clear or not so i will do pre-order pre-ordered mean before ordered i go to the company i also want to know that this company is eligible to get halal certificate or not but <clears throat> this we also uh, the company also know that they are eligible to get the halal certificate or not in this case pre-ordered helps a lot about 90 percent things become clear that this company this product this uh, line this ingredients can get halal certificate so pre-ordered really helps after pre-ordered you give them some advice that uh, please change this i don't want to certify this and then they do sometime this uh, I, I mentioned in the next slide also that the mail telephone information about ingredients pre-ordered this until this job is done by uh, consultant company this is not a job of our, uh, certification bodies why because a certification body does the same thing is called conflict of interest although all the accreditation bodies are doing a lot of uh, conflict of interest but if any certification body will do the conflict of interest they will not certify them so we have to be very careful <clears throat> so after audit audit report is necessary must and then uh, halal certification is done and after halal certification is done it's not that our job is finished we have to do the surveillance uh, sometimes companies uh, halal certification body issue for one year certificate sometimes two year certificate sometimes three year certificate but even those who issue the three year certificate every year they do the surveillance audit and that is uh, very necessary for uh, all this you know, procedure of halal certification this slide as uh, i just mentioned you a second ago that advice and discussions pre-ordered halal consulting and halal training should be done by a consultant companies and in pakistan if you are talking about pakistan pakistan has a lot of gap till now to start this many many consultant companies those food scientists who are today students they learn properly halal from everybody and then they can open their consultant uh, consultancy companies uh, to give to consultancy to the companies who want to give, get the halal certificate so then the halal certification body job will also become easier why because all documents will be ready all uh, things has been taught to them the training has been done to them consultancy has been done and company is ready the halal certification body go check uh, check 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 clear 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 and then within a very short time uh, that thing can be certified <clears throat> The documents required for getting halal certificate again is a vary from organization to organization. It varies from uh, company to company, means certification body to certification body, country to country also varies. But the basics will consist of this number of documents which I mentioned here in the slide. That uh, list of products needed, ingredients needed, ingredients more details needed. If those are animal based ingredients and halal certificate is needed the procedure of that company is needed and how they are producing halal uh, food the company registration is must because really if company is properly working or just uh, like without any uh, government authority they get license or not but by themselves they're working if they're working by themselves there is a process pro uh, possibility of cheating can be done but if it is working under country law, then many things are under control from that point. Uh, then inventory records are there, there or not there, processing records are there or not there, uh, filling and packaging and dispatch. And why this all records are necessary? Because you can do the traceability of the things. If you are a food scientist, many of you are food scientists, you will know that the traceability of the product is very important. Like if you are uh, buying uh, 30 kilogram of wheat and then 20 kilogram of sugar and making bread uh, then after mixing you should get like a 50 loaf of bread but uh, you are getting 30 loaf of bread so you will know that oh why 20 are lost so somewhere uh, machine is not working properly or something is uh, wrong with the procedure or loss is happening a lot so it's all not good for any food industry so records are very very much and important then halal mark records must be there 
uh, halal team members should be dedicated people who learn about halal from us certification bodies and then they should go uh, in a field they should do also the internal audits by themselves uh, then many of the places there are halal threats are there i was working in the vita bread in pakistan in lahore and in rawalpindi and if i remind now i know that there are many halal threats were there which i didn't know at that time so if you can uh, know what are those halal threats uh, you can uh, create proper system to address those threats and those threats will be gone and your production quality will be better uh, your your halalness will be better and the claim record necessities changes are necessary sop of the production is necessary uh, record of quality control is very important claim record is important so these are the very basic uh, things i am mentioning but honestly speaking that uh, plus minus 2 3 4 5 documents would be required some other place otherwise most of the time these are the documents Uh, like in Japan, because some countries they produce the pork and they produce the halal also, so we are very much worried that this is really traceability is proper or not. So we ask them to do the DNA testing also. So DNA testing is really uh, help us to uh, move further. Now the halal certification I mentioned to you until now halal certification as a religion, and secondly I mentioned to you halal certification as a science. and halal certification as a technology and now we are moving toward halal certification as a business uh business is next slide if you go there first question comes that why halal certificate what for what halal certification is necessary so in the very beginning like 70 years ago malaysia and other countries who realized that there is a threat in their food of halal production so they started from food and beverages in the very beginning it was only food and beverages uh, but with the passage of time they realized that if we, they go to do the certification of food and beverages they definitely need to certify the ingredients otherwise it takes a very long procedure to trace trace the ingredients so uh, uh, with the passage of time now malaysia and indonesia reached to the level where they say uh, all company and all ingredients must be halal certified they can say that they have enough certified production certified ingredients but here in japan we cannot say that probably pakistan india or, or nigeria or other uh, african countries they are still not that level that each of their ingredients is halal certified but uh, halal certification of ingredients will help a lot to that country that business of that country the gdp of that country that ingredients are really sellable things and bigger quantity sellable things so country should live so then we have to see the processing is halal or not and logistics is also right. recently we are getting involved in logistics that uh, halal dedicated trucks must be used halal dedicated containers must be used halal dedicated storage houses must be used and when time comes more modern we involve in the cosmetics halal cosmetics are necessary so many companies are getting halal cosmetics the halal medicines are also coming Uh, in the market so as much as things are getting businesses like i tell you that uh, today in this seminar i think probably non muslims are also there honestly speaking muslims and non muslims both are doing business under the name of halal so if we the muslims be very careful then the non muslims also will be careful that okay you can uh, uh, do the uh, business on the halal but keep the integrity of halal this integrity is very very important uh questions being will be asked later uh, i will come back to there are some certain people asking can we ask question yes you can ask question later inshallah and if the time is not there you can send the email to the hrc and they will forward it to me and i will reply in return inshallah now the halal as a business if you say all businesses are based on major principles of demand and supply this is a very basic economic principle i have learned in 1987 really very early stages of uh, economics lesson they say demand and supply the first thing we learn is demand if there will be demand then the supply is necessary if demand is not there you make very best product you make a very high quality halal certification you do whatever if demand is not there what for so very very important is that there must be a demand and i will come to the infrastructure 
in front, you know the usually <clears throat> muslim people think that uh, halal we like pakistan let's talk about pakistan pakistani says oh we are, every product is halal why we need to get the halal it is not for you it is for the your products when they go to the another countries they want to know that you do you have enough infrastructure to produce a halal food or not and then if you have an enough infrastructure mean you have a good company you have a clean company you have good ingredients your ingredients are coming from a halal source and then you make a halal product this all system supply chain we call it that all supply chain if will be full of halal things then the trust will be more now the trust of like let's say we compare malaysia uh, and japan like if made in malaysia and made in japan you compare halal products probably made in japan people will trust more why because it's not that they do not trust malaysians they trust more the japanese one why because their products all the cars their industry their big machinery their uh, cosmetics their whatever the product you will see very high quality so the consumer trust automatically go to them and then they say okay we trust made in japan halal is better than made in malaysia or if you compare made in malaysia made in pakistan then people will say oh we trust made in malaysia more than made in pakistan so this trust in this business is very very important next comes the politics politics we we don't like most of the time but we cannot run away from this so each country like for example uh, malaysia and indonesia working in the shafi system uh, fika but both of them are very politically like my product is better other says my product is better similarly like uae was recently in the halal uh, certification system or accreditation system but saudi arabia says no 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 we also want to do the accreditation of our own why because our accreditation is better so this is not about religion this is not about science this is not about technology this is about politics we can, we don't like it but we cannot run away from this so please remember that the politics is very very important part, part of halal business and halal business has demand all over the world honestly speaking if you muslims are living only in indonesia only in pakistan or only in malaysia then you have very limited market but now the muslims are living from east to west to north to south whichever the country you name it muslims are there and the demand is there it doesn't matter the number of people the muslim people usually as you see uh, indonesian malaysian pakistanis uh, indian muslims uh, arab muslims egyptian muslims uh, african muslim all of fat why because we consume the food three times more than the normal other human beings so muslim population if let's say there are 100 people we eat uh, 300 people food so that is also one of the important business point in this and the supply level varies region to region what, what do i mean by region to region like nowadays in japan we have worked hard and created a muslim uh, environment and a halal environment and but our restaurants and our hotels want halal food i mean there are halal ingredients but supply is not enough so is now the demand is more supply is not there and talking about um, pakistan you have a lot of products you have, you have a lot of demand is also there supply is also there uh, talking about malaysia or singapore let's say singapore is a small country but the demand is a lot so the supply coming from other countries so these things are factors of any uh, any kind of business but particularly halal business now if you see the demographic of a muslim uh, population around the world you see indonesia is a very highly populated country uh, india bangladesh pakistan uh, these three four five countries have a huge population of muslims and once let's say we are, have a halal certi certified product it doesn't mean that only muslim will eat muslim plus alpha plus uh, non muslim everybody will eat that so there is no issue that muslim will eat and non muslim will not eat uh, all religion as far as i know uh, hindus buddhist uh, christian jews everybody uh, have no issue that they don't want to eat halal food so you have a big chance you have big market and this market who realize that the non muslim countries around the world they have realized that <clears throat> your your halal food is very high quality so i put here the list of 
list of countries who are producers and the list of countries who are buyer. If you see around list of countries who are producer are America, Canada, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, China, Thailand, India, France, Germany, England, Norway, Finland, South Africa. All these are non-Muslim countries, but they are high grade, high quality producer of halal certified products. A lot of halal certification bodies are working there, like America, like Brazil. Just talking about Brazil, there are 0.02 percent Muslims are there but they are selling the halal certified chicken, 54% share of the world of halal certified chicken coming from Brazil. Similarly, Australia, all over the world, they supply the beef and this beef, almost every plant in uh, slaughterhouse in, in uh, Australia is halal certified. And sometimes they say, Indonesia says, we do not accept Malaysian halal certified uh, slaughterhouse. So, uh, Singapore says we do not accept the in Indonesian halal certified. Uh, so what Australia has done, this is infrastructure. So for this business, they got, I know one slaughterhouse which has 11 halal certificates from different places that we have all halal certificate, whichever you want, tell us, we will get it. So this is really infrastructure. This is nothing to do with the uh, religion. So now this is a business. Malaysia, Turkey, Pakistan, Indonesia is also making halal food, but unfortunately the level is not that level that they, they can compete the non-Muslim countries. And the buyer countries are Malaysia, Indonesia, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, uh, Thailand, India, Bangladesh, Turkey, Pakistan. Uh, you know that we say about 7 billion uh, people are in this world and 25% are Muslims. And within 25% of these Muslims, about 5% definitely will buy your product no matter whichever the country you are living in. So whichever the country you are living in, you can produce to 5% uh, of the 25% of the whole total population, your product will be sellable. So these producer and uh, buyer countries are listed in front of you. Please go through in more literature and search how you can uh, do better in this halal certification. Now I come to the halal in Pakistan, which is, was actually the main topic, but uh, I went around the world first, then I come to Pakistan. Now in Pakistan, history of halal in Pakistan is not very old, unfortunately. Uh, I started a halal certification body in Japan is in 2010. And in Pakistan, I was reading one literature that 2010 uh, was the first time when Pakistanis people realized that, okay, we should have some certain sort of standards. Now you have the standards, you have a accreditation body there. You have certain certification bodies are also there. You have established very good standards there. Uh, education, like now, Alhamdulillah, 200 food scientists are learning through this seminar. Uh, so many people want to learn what is halal. Awareness to the public is not yet there. Awareness in the normal public is really like, a, what do you call, if somebody do the backbiting, it goes more faster in Pakistani culture as compared to the truth. Let's say if you say uh, blah blah company is a juice company and you do, should not buy that product, so everybody will stop buying that product. But in other words, uh, if you say that that person is producing a halal product, please buy that one. Oh, we don't need halal food. Everything is our our food is halal. So I don't need to go to halal certification. So you have to give really a good hard work, which is our our brothers where Mughal is really working hard to give the awareness to the Pakistanis. Recently, he did a lot of seminars from Peshawar to uh, Karachi. So this kind of awareness seminars are very much needed. And I really appreciate Mr. Zubair Mughal about this matter. If I will have a chance, inshallah, I'm ready to teach on a small scale basis, like every university, every place, every city, wherever through this uh, web seminar I can teach. Now the, you have enough certification bodies, it's a very good thing. You have accreditation body, it's also a very good thing. Uh, the government is taking interest, it's a very good thing. Uh, government is making certain rules and regulations, very good thing. But as I mentioned in the very early stage of the seminar, that there is something having the law and there is something following the law. In Pakistan culture particularly, we have a lot of laws, religious laws and non-religious laws. But unfortunately, we do not care much about uh, all kind of laws, religious and non religious doesn't matter. So our Muslims, our people should do 
a halal lifestyle from morning till evening, halal lifestyle, then inshallah you will see that the trust will develop. Then once the trust will develop, then you the second stage you have to go to the make a relationship with the whole world. That look, our Pakistani standards are good. Our Pakistani people are good, creating good food, are good cosmetics, are good uh, production system. We have good SOP. We have. And you can trust our product. We are not liar. We are not cheater. We are not like we do not show the different high quality sample, and we do not uh, sell the bad quality product. But over now our system is improved and we are really trustable people, then your business will increase a lot. So there are some plus in Pakistan, there are some minuses in Pakistan. You have to work on minuses and then the things will get better inshallah. As a business, awareness to the consumer is very, very important. Within Pakistan, we have a huge, big population. If they start taking care of the halal food, you need not to export to any other country. You have enough number of people within the country to consume those halal products. But awareness is not there, unfortunately. Education to industry is also very important. Then, as I mentioned, only the high-scale industries, the multinational companies, they understand the importance of the this halal in their industry. But how about the SMEs? How about the small-scale companies, which is really working with the 10 people, 20 people? If they will get, they, or they will understand the halal, Inshallah, the halal situation will get better in Pakistan. And if the things get better, you are able to not only sell to Pakistan, you, very close countries like UAE, Saudi Arabia is your big market. So you need not to go very far, very close. Your market is ready to buy your product. Only as I mentioned, trust is very important. So get the trust of the people. Pakistan halal business will fly, Inshallah, very high. Uh, I pray and I really always care and always worry that Pakistani business should go better. Now we come back to the world business, which is halal in the world as a business. Honestly, it's a three trillion US dollar business and I'm talking about only those which is halal certified products. There are many, 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 many halal products which is moving around the world, which is not yet certified, but they are still moving. That, that figure is not within this. This three trillion US dollar uh, figure is that halal certified products. So as I mentioned, many, many countries are producing uh, halal food, which is non-Muslim countries. They realize this is a business. They realize this infrastructure, their infrastructure of producing halal is better. So they produce halal, Muslim will buy that. And uh, it's this market, like in Japan, the population is decreasing very drastically. In Italy, decreasing. In Europe, France, Germany, decreasing. In Singapore, decreasing. In America, the population is decreasing, but only the place wherever the Muslims are, they are increasing in number. Why? Because they like they like to have a lot of children, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless us with a lot of baraka. That is why uh, it's this business, particular business. All other businesses are going down. Only the halal certified business is increasing and growing. So it's just uh, what we call the party just started kind of thing. That please go on. Those students who are learning this halal get involved more in this halal science and halal technology and halal business. Those industries who are not yet get halal certified things in Pakistan and other countries get halal certification, and you you will have a big chance to uh, to open the big market in front of you. Now this is the politics. Like recently in Indonesia, they have make a system that all products must be halal certified, which is being imported. Actually, this is. Not nothing to do with the halal directly. It is indirectly in Indonesia world that uh, they cannot control the World Trade Organization rules, but they control they can control the halal rules and they can reduce a little bit of uh, uh, imports to their country. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, politics-wise, from halal standards point of view, no unified or harmonized standard is there. Uh, each country wants to be leader. Like I have attended many lectures from Indonesia, Malaysia. UAE, Turkey, whichever the country you listen, they want that we are the leader. We are the leader. Nobody else can be uh, take the leadership from us. Actually, in my opinion, if they all of these five, six major countries, if they share the leadership, like one become president, one become general secretary, one become finance secretary, and all these finances they share, the responsibilities they share, they can do much, much better as compared to what they are doing now. But unfortunately, 
until today there is no chance I can see in the very near future that there will be one person stand up and say okay let's share the leadership currently leadership is here and there as an infrastructure again I will say that <coughs> infrastructures need uh, proper standards harmonized standards harmonized halal mark uh, harmonized uh, understanding the uh, what do you call the uh, rule of engagement those kind of things are needed this infrastructure is not yet there it is needed very much in future i hope i pray inshallah very soon allah will make it possible that halal infrastructure can be in line so we the muslims can get proper halal food from all over the world in a proper harmonized way. we are living in a in a global village so in this global village we have to understand the needs and the requirements of other places like for example nowadays food is not only made in pakistan when the food is made in pakistan the ingredients of one food is made in japan that is exported to china some half product is made in china ingredients are made in china from the same ingredient then go to pakistan pakistan produce that then go to malaysia malaysia buy that so there is really no boundary no passport needed for this kind of products so that is why that uh, infrastructure which is harmonized infrastructure is very much needed inshallah i hope i pray that inshallah in very near, near future these things can be happen possible now i have spent about uh, one hour and 40 minutes and i am ready to open the question and answer session for certain uh, brothers and sisters from whichever the country they are uh, i would be very happy to reply certain things you can write your question here I will try to reply or uh, you can send me by email later and I can inshallah handle your question. I hope you like it. It was very fast. It was very basic. It was very like a uh, general. So please uh, ask any question if I can reply. There is a question about Afghanistan. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have really no understanding of Afghanistan, but I will request our brother uh, Mughal that he will take your question and he will search and he will reply your question later by email, inshallah. Thank you very much for attending the seminar wherever you are. Be safe and yeah, love protect you always, your family, your friends. By a halal consultant, you should get enough knowledge and make enough infrastructure like two, three friends get together, make a, a company, open a consultant company and meet with so many halal certification bodies, understand what is their rules and regulations and as per rules and regulation of those uh, countries uh, sorry the certification bodies or countries then make give the consultancy to the companies indian halal certificate valid in pakistan or not if you are accredited if that certification body is accredited by pnac pakistan national accreditation council uh, then i think it's possible How do we get job in these organizations? Uh, this job things, I'm sorry, I, I'm not very much good in this. Uh, please ask Brother Zubair. He will, uh, inshallah, reply you privately. Is there any relationship between halal industry and Islamic finance? Uh, not directly, but as you know that both are Islamic laws. So is, some have explained the Islamic finance, some have explained the Islamic law about halal. 
so somewhat we are related like our again i'll give example of brother was a bad mogul who is the chairperson of this uh, hrc uh, he is doing both halal certification and uh, islamic finance also so you can get advice from him how gmo is work is uh, effectiveness halal Uh, GMO, if coming from a plant source, it is considered as halal. If it is coming from animal source, usually people do not uh, consider it as halal. How you can check the dead uh, uh, meat of dead animal is not possible to check one thing by a simple person, but some professionals. when we see a dead animal uh, dead meat i mean dead animal meat the blood remain there inside the body so it's more red even in the chicken shape more red than the normal so whenever the uh, animal uh, is not yet properly slaughtered and not yet properly bleed then the blood remain in the body and is more red difference of uh, halal and haram meat usually certif- that is why we prefer all of you to please eat the certified meat or the certified products so that somebody has done a traceability for on your behalf Brother Amar from Malaysia, thank you very much for attending this special from Malaysia. Halal slaughtering in halal working environment can a non-Muslim lead a halal team? Secondly, non-Muslim cannot lead a halal team in the slaughterhouse, but in other places, a non-Muslim can lead a. Uh, halal team for if the production is being on a halal based on ingredients and other stuff and the halal starting a halal working environment it need a separate webinar a separate lecture on this matter i'm sorry that i cannot reply here in very short things inshallah if you contact me privately or through hrc email or we can do private zoom meeting i can explain that chicken uh, is halal of course is a halal animal but if it is slaughtered properly as islamic principle law then it will become halal if it is not slaughtered properly then it is not halal uh somalia my dear brother somalia i really <laughs> I appreciate that you join from there uh, I really very much like that I can do something about Somalia uh, you can have a private chat with me maybe I can guide you something about that farming chicken if you go with the proper feed and proper high quality standards of uh, farming it, you have a great chance of doing business if as i mentioned brazil can earn uh, 54% share of the halal chicken of the whole world why not you i mean you you have a chance very big chance that you can uh, produce a halal chicken in a halal farming in a very high quality environment and inshallah that chicken will be very much sellable i can help you Uh, more than me i think brother zubair mughal can help you for afghanistan consultancy please contact brother zubair mughal or this uh, hrc team uh, where you have registered this uh, for this seminar inshallah they will guide you properly for afghanistan i think brother zubair mughal is very much international person he would have been to afghanistan and he can guide you properly inshallah organ of animals which halal animal organs properly halal certified uh, are halal inshallah and if 
halal animal not properly certified as not halal and there are certain organs like for example the goat or sheep here without slaughtering animals we are receiving that so those are halal naturally in the beginning without even the halal slaughtering because we are getting those hairs when the animal is alive different standards of insects is of course it is same as uh, in, it is in a harafi uh, shafi and maliki they have different standards so uh, our whichever the country you are in inshallah the muftis uh, can guide you properly about those uh, whichever the countries you are like uh, shafi maliki hambali they have different rules about uh, insects Okay, can you suggest a book covering all aspects of halal certification? Yes, there is a book, it's called Halal Food Production, written by Dr. Munir Chaudhary uh, from Ifanka, America. Although it's a bit old version now, maybe five, ten years before, but still the basics of halal, you can get it from there. One of my uh, direct teacher is that book, actually. Prawns, prawns are halal, inshallah. Most of the time, I think in all Hanafi also is halal, everywhere is halal, inshallah. Only which is not halal is a, a Shia. A Shia prawns are not halal. Dr. Farid Malik, thank you very much for joining the seminar from Burundi Darussalam. This uh, injection and growth injection for animal increased weight. This is the malpractices. It's nothing to do about halal or not halal. This is the malpractices of that certain human being. And when that certain human being will do that, he is earning a non-halal income for his children. If he earned this kind of income and go back home and buy the halal certified products, that halal certified products will not be halal, according to my understanding. So those kind of malpractices never ever allowed in Islam. Horse is uh, again is depend on fika. Some people says horse is halal. Some people says horse is uh, makru, but nobody says horse is haram. So it's, it's different opinion are about uh, halal and uh, makru only. The GMO question is work effectiveness halal? I don't think so because nowadays all over the world they are stopping this GMO and even in Japan they do not allow the GMO products. It's not about halal, it's not healthy for us, it's not good for us, it can create different kind of diseases. So people are nowadays even in the Japanese labels is written that it's not GMO product. Mean that people are, don't like GMO products. Claim records, uh, there was one document need to claim record. Claim record is usually when a good practice is happening in any industry, uh, then the product go to the market, in the market, any consumer see the product and they say there is a, I found there is a hair in the, in the food product. So then that food product as such been dispatched back to the industry. They go to their records and they see, and then they say, uh, keep the record that this kind of claim has been come from uh, a kind of a client and we should be careful and we should do more high quality practices that this uh, hair or insects should not go inside the food. That is called claim record. Uh, Talat Majid Sam, I have replied horse is halal or not halal. So it is uh, halal in certain countries. It is macro in certain countries, certain country by country, I mean in FIC actually. So like you go to Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, it is halal there. You go to Indonesia, uh, one part of Indonesia is halal, others they don't eat. So it's really different opinion about this uh, animal.
mashbu is a shubha, it's a doubtful things. Uh, it must be clear. Those things which is not so clear, we, we should make it clear. So those clear things we should not eat. Grasshopper is halal actually. If you go to properly uh, go in Islamic rules and regulation, this insect is considered as halal. This uh, brother or sister from Somalia, uh, please, our HRC, HRC team will uh, respond to your question later that want different presentations. There is a question that is it mandatory for a company to have Muslim employee in order to get halal certification? In Malaysia, in Indonesia, it is necessary. In Pakistan, I'm sorry, I don't know. But in Malaysia, Indonesia, it is necessary. In Japan, it is not necessary. In Islam, by basic principle of Islam, it is not necessary. In a uh, meat company, uh, what do you call, the slaughterman is 100% must, whichever the country they are, they must be a Muslim. Other than slaughterman, the person who cut the meat, who remove the skin, the boning process, cutting process, non-Muslim is okay, no problem. Our brother is replying that in Malaysia it is halal to eat grasshopper. Our brother is asking Islamic financial planning. I think our brother Zubair Mughal is the best person to ask for this question. He is a very expert of this Islamic finance. Halal food production. Okay, uh, now I think it's uh, almost time is done. We have finished our two hours. I would be very happy, very happy if you have more questions, send by email to our HRC team and they will forward it to me. And I'm always happy to serve all Muslim nation, non-Muslim nation, wherever they are. If they want to know about halal, about halal industry, about halal science, uh, about anything related to Halal, which I can reply, I would be very happy to reply that. Can we finish today's session? Okay, everybody say Allah Hafiz. Inshallah, Allah Hafiz. Thank you very much. And be safe with your family and friends. Allah Hafiz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.